Why is it so hard to leave the church? Next on the Ex-Mormon Files. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Ex-Mormon Files. I'm your host, Bishop Earl, and we're still here with Lisa Brockman, and it's such a thrill. You're from Orlando. Yes. I appreciate you coming all the way to share your story. And she's written a book. We're going to hear more about the details of that book. It's Out of Zion, Meeting Jesus in the Shadow of the Mormon Temple. But I started out, why is it so hard to leave the church? And here's, for two reasons, There's, we're considered in outer darkness, when you leave the church, and we're apostates. Yes. I mean, we're the worst kinds of sinners. Yes. I think the families would probably rather have us dead than probably. leave the church. Mm. But this is some, the, the, you wrote this in the book, and I just, um, we're going to talk more about your book here in a minute, but here's some of the things that, um, um, I'm sorry, that are said about us as we leave the church. Mm. They didn't seek with a sincere heart. They looked for answers in non-Mormon sources. They didn't want to pay tithing anymore. Mm -hmm. They want to drink coffee, tea. They don't like getting up for church on Sundays. And they've been deceived by false doctrines. Mm -hmm. And then on this page, you've written, you are the apostate who wrecked the eternal family. You didn't uh, search with a genuine heart. Otherwise, should still be, should still have a testimony that the church is true. She didn't understand the gospel. Um, as you mentioned, Gary fed her a bunch of lies and uh, just didn't, and she just believed it all. Mm -hmm. And um, the cross. You had an interesting story, interaction with your mom about the cross, right? You, I did. You were wearing a cross and. <laughs> well, as Mormons, we didn't believe in the cross. Like, no. the cross was not a positive thing. Right. We didn't have them in our churches. We, the cross was not something to be adored. Right. It was not something to boast in, as the Apostle Paul says. And so I remember after I had that experience on my 21st birthday where I gave every addiction to Jesus, every part of me gave him access to just set me free, and he did. I could not wait to get a cross. And so it was like 1990 and, or 80, yeah, 1990 and, or 91. And all they had were these gothic, bright, bold gold crosses at the Christian bookstore, which I thought, this rocks. Like, I will not wear this in the presence of my family, yeah. but when I'm Come not on. with family, I will wear this with pride. And so I got my cross. Well, I just told my family I was a Christian about a few weeks earlier. And it was a Saturday, and I thought, I'm not going to see my family today. So I I'll put on put my, my cross, cross, and I was at my little house. And my mom had sent me a letter the day before, and it was a six-page letter. And it was a very, like, she had poured out all of her angst and about my leaving the, the church. The concerns and the Well, I think it was filled with so much emotion. It wasn't concern. Like she hmm. had, she made comments like, you've destroyed the family. Mm -hmm. You've used us for our unconditional love. Um, you need to return to church with us or else. Things like that, where it was just her grasping at whatever she could do. And I don't fault her for any of it. No. I think if I were in her shoes, I could be guilty of the same thing. Sure. But when I got that letter in the mail, we didn't have email, so it came in snail mail. It was just like the oh, the heaviest weight on me, a punch in the gut. I already, um, our journey for several weeks had already been so emotional and yeah. painful for everybody. So my greatest joy was their greatest devastation. <laughs> and I was very in tune with that. And I think God just gave me a compassion for them, which I'm grateful for. Um, so all that to say, I'm home alone with this letter and I didn't know how to respond and I wasn't ready to. And so my dear mom shows up, I hear the doorbell, I go answer the door, I have my big gold cross on. <laughs> and 
my mom's there just with tears streaming down her face. And she's like, mm -hmm. I haven't heard from you. And I sent you that letter. And I just need to know if you're OK. And she, she was so, so much. she does. Yeah. Like, she's a lover. And so, but when I open the door, she goes, what's around your neck? <laughs> and then she lunged forward to yank it off my neck and fell over the threshold of my door. I took Ooh. a step back of my oh. doorway and I was like, holy cow. Like that's the impact of the cross <laughs> on them. But she loves you so much. and She uh, does, uh, she does. Yeah. She's been a warrior. <laughs> Well, as I went through the book, and I just was so impressed with wh how you've written it, and you said that it took you, uh, I mean, it's been in the last six years that you were writing it, but more specifically in the last year or so. Well, right? I wrote the publisher's proposal, which only included the first chapter. It was all the book overview, chapter overviews, things like that. So once Harvest House publisher gave me the offer that they were going to buy my book, yeah. um, then I started writing. So I'd only written the first chapter, but when Harvest House sent the offer, they, what I'd heard from the Lord the whole time I was working on that proposal for five long years, which <laughs> that's really long to write a proposal, um, was my timing is perfect. I would just keep hearing God whisper, my timing is perfect. Don't, and I just trusted worry. that. And my agent was so patient. They yeah. would, I think they forgot about me for some <laughs> years because I would submit nothing for a whole year. Life was just full and hard. And so the first words from Harvest House were perfect timing exclamation point. Wow. And we were so captivated by the first by the first chapter. Our marketing director asked if you could submit another hundred pages for review. Quickly. So that was so affirming and I was blown away. I did not think I was did gonna get come, a publisher. Did it come easily as you started working on it? And oh did, no. Did, did you struggle with that? It? I've worked through my story many times over the years with counselors, spiritual directors, in community. God's done a lot of healing, but I have never to write my story knowing this is going to go out to the masses and, and family. it's about family. <laughs> yeah. It's not just my story. It's my parents' story. Yeah. And from my perspective, alongside Mormon doctrine, researching Mormon doctrine, making sure I have all my doctrine accurate as I knew it to be, that works based acceptance. That God, that Mormon vision of God who blesses if you're worthy and removes blessing if you're not, <laughs> who loves you if you're worthy, removes blessing if you're Climb not. Up, as I wrote my story <laughs> alongside that shadow, yeah. That was just a heart-wrenching journey was it? of shame, shame, so much shame. Um, and I realized how much, you know, the most important thing about us is our view of God and its associated images. And I realized how much that, that energy of that view of God still can infiltrate <laughs> my life today. And it's been 29 years since I came to the biblical Jesus. Now explain that a little bit more. Do you mean the, the what we have to be doing instead of what he's done for us? Is that what, do, what, how, is that what you How mean? that view? I think that I still can tend to, or we have to work. deal with shame. Oh, shame. Okay. And I, there's no shame in the kingdom. Jesus absorbed it all. But okay. still, Thanks there will be shame for behavior, shame yeah. for the way I don't love well, rather than brokenness, which leads to repentance, which leads to a release of who I'm designed to be even yeah. more. So I think that's what I saw. Hmm. And then simmering in my childhood, simmering in that works-based yeah. place, that was... I haven't simmered there like that. And then knowing I need to release my relationships once again. I did that when I left Mormonism. I feel like I'm leaving Mormonism all over again. That's what it felt like. Oh boy. In fact, two months before the book release, my uh, publisher was asking me to engage in marketing. And the idea of doing, putting out information on social media was just dreadful to me. I've just been so tender toward my family 
and I tender you don't toward want to those offend, relations. But, no, but you want to educate and. Well, and God has very much invited me to write this story and to continue writing, even though yeah. I jumped ship so many times and stopped. <laughs> And so I knew this is a calling on my life that I'm supposed to write, and I'm going to be faithful to that. So, so what I liked about it is, especially for a, a well, a Mormon for certainly, but uh, even for Christians, that they would get a sense of uh, more in depth about baptism for the dead and sacrament and mm -hmm. worship and uh, just the different topics of Mormonism, the temple, and all those things. You've covered those as your journey carried you mm -hmm. through those different things, and I think it's really, really insightful. There were a few things that I ran through as I did this, and maybe we'll finish up with it. Did you have some thoughts or things you wanted to share real quickly, or anything that you've come across or as well, we've done even, this a little bit? Even for what's interesting is a friend of mine is a she's a Christian therapist um, counselor, and she read the book like an overnight. Yeah. And she ordered two more copies the next day for clients of hers who are Christians but are struggling with their vision of God being that oh, it's really? performance-based yeah. love and acceptance. And that's not who God is. Right. And so she's like, this is not just for Mormons, post-Mormons. This is for Christians too. Because through my story, all the vision of the biblical God. I didn't write this as an anti-Mormon book. No, I wrote this as a all. loving and compassionate it window into the culture right. of Mormonism and the doctrine and my journey toward the biblical Jesus. And what my hope is, is that this is, this is a vision of the biblical God that's so compelling, you will want to taste and see him. And you've had some good responses, right? Yes. Have you? It's been very encouraging. Oh, that's good. And it's just been out, like we said, October 1st. Yes. So that's, that's, yes. that's awesome. Well, a couple of the thoughts that I came across, and, and we've covered a, a few of these, but um, um, just one was working for my glory mm -hmm. and my goal, mm -hmm. you know, and having my idols. Any, yes. any thoughts on that? We just... Well, I didn't know that that's what we were doing in Mormonism. I didn't know that working toward exaltation into Godhood was working for my glory. I don't know, but it's because I didn't have the contrast of glorifying God. That wasn't in my paradigm of understanding that right. there's that's this so holy true. God yeah. who's completely with me because of Jesus. Like he designed us to be in his community of love, of this Trinitarian community. And we give all glory to him. Yes. And what so, he did for us. Right. That we couldn't do for ourselves, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. so because there wasn't the contrast, you know when you have, you don't know what good is without bad. Yeah. You don't know what dark is without light. Right. You don't know when you're glorifying yourself if you haven't had a vision of glorifying God. Yeah. That's excellent. And chapter seven, I just loved. This was layers. And I think it was the things that you were learning. One was the Bible is God's word. Yes. That you can trust it and that there's archaeology for it. And, and yes. it actually has come forth. Yeah, it's got a few warts and a few wrinkles here and there. But it's got the message of, of the gospel. Yes. The good news. Yes. Of, of who God is and what Jesus did for us. And that Jesus is the only begotten of the Father. And when I read that, to, not today, but when I read that, it all of a sudden struck me that, and I've never applied this to pre-existence before, but mm -hmm. Jesus is the only begotten of the Father. That kind of puts a different perspective on pre-existence. But, yes. but anyway, a need for a Savior. And I think that's uh, something that's, again, explained and discussed in chapter For eternal seven life, yeah. not just overcoming death. Right. And that there is no difference between <laughs> salvation and eternal life. You were talking about resurrection, and we kind of think, well, that's what Jesus did for everybody. Right. Uh, but we have to do the rest for our eternal life. And, yes. And uh, so you covered that. And uh, let me just look here real quickly and apologize for that's this. Fine. Um, you had an interesting experience with a psychiatrist who told you to forgive your parents. Well, yes, my mom became um, my leaving. My departure from the Mormon Church affected her mental health 
Oh. And so she was seeing a psychiatrist, a Mormon psychiatrist, who was a wonderful man, uh, to help, just help her process through that. And, or psychologist, I don't know which he was. So anyway, but he asked to see me so that he could better treat her. Mm. And so I went and saw him and he asked me my story. So I just shared with him my version of the story. And he said, Lisa, nobody was ever designed to endure what you've been through with your parents the last five months. But you're one of the most psychologically healthy people in my office. <laughs> and I was like, Jesus, 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 Jesus. <laughs> like just all things Jesus, which I really do think it was Jesus. You know, he just, when Jesus is at the center, there's a grounding that is unexplainable. Mm -hmm. And so, um, after that, he said, well, there's nothing. He said, thank you for coming in. Let's work with forgiveness because there have been uh, places in your relationship with your parents where it would be important yeah. for you to forgive. Yeah. And I said, I have forgiven them. And he looked back and he said, well, let's process that a little. So after about five minutes, he said, wow, you have forgiven them. And I think what I'd grown up with is there was no concept of forgiveness without work. I had to even work for forgiveness. Uh -huh. And so when he was so shocked that I'd forgiven them, that I could keep forgiving and forgiving with all these conversations we were having that were very painful and hurtful. Um, and I'm not saying it's just one-sided, but what was on my end, um, he was pretty surprised by that. And about 18 months later, before I moved to Orlando with my husband, Dennis, I was driving with my mom to Lake Powell and she said, you know, I've been wanting to share with you for a long time. Maybe it was only a year later. When I went back and saw the doctor after he met with you, oh. he told my mom and dad, he said, you know, in my practice, I've never encountered somebody so committed to her family and so committed to Jesus Christ. And you're trying, you need to just let her walk the path she's walking. So wow. that was pretty remarkable. Yeah. Did that comfort mom at all? And it did. Yeah. She, she realized she's, it helped her see a different vision of this story we're living. Yeah. It was hard. It's still, you know, it's devastating. For Mormon parents. Well, we break up the eternal family. Right. And they love you. Uh, you can tell you're a close-knit, wonderful family. Mm -hmm. They've been there for you, supported you through your sports and your yeah. piano and all those things that you've done over your life. And, and, and they, they, they're afraid they've lost you to outer darkness. And, yes. Yeah. And it's hard for them to understand yes. that. I don't know what I, would have happened if my kids had come to me as a as the parent before I came out mm. and they came to me and said that it would have hurt because I would yeah. have realized they broken that uh, eternal family yes. concept yes that's very devastating so where are your now I, I your mom has gone to with you to church in in Orlando are things any better that way? Oh, then? I think, yeah, two years was pretty tumultuous for all of us. Yeah. And then when we moved to Orlando, <clears throat> it, my dad and I would, he's great at writing letters. Is he's he? always, yeah, been a wonderful communicator and pursuer that way. Yeah. And so he would, <clears throat> my dad and I went, conversed through email and snail mail over pretty much every major doctrinal difference. Really? And then we would talk to the talk on the phone every week and not talk about any of it. Oh. <laughs> and so my dad and I had those letters of correspondence that were, I think, unique yeah. for that season of life. But my parents, they just long for relationship. And I think that's one of the most beautiful things about them is they've worked so hard to maintain relationship with us, with our kids, and bridging bridging the, this gulf between us. And so, yeah, my mom, when she, she would come to town at least twice a year and help me homeschool. I homeschooled the kids for 13 years, 
God help us all, we survived. <laughs> and my mom would come and she'd just get right in there. She'd homeschool the kids with me. She'd do laundry. Aww. She was just, she's a very active grandma. And my dad, when he could come, he was a doctor, so he didn't have as much freedom. But when he came, they're just very present with us. So my mom occasionally would come to church with us and just worked hard to mm -hmm. enter into our world. And then there was a season when my dad was doing temporary work up in New York, upstate New York, and he would get to, he would fly down to Orlando maybe once a month and spend the weekend with us. Yeah. And our director of our choir, we go to First Presbyterian Church in Orlando, a beautiful choir. Well, she invited my dad who was in the Tabernacle Choir to come sing with our choir. And my dad and did? did it. And he would put on that robe with a cross at his neck. Really? <laughs> and he would sit up in the stands and they'd give him the music and he could read it and he would sing with our choir. So, I mean, those are just two stories of how my parents have worked uh, um, really hard to enter my world too. Yeah, I'm proud of them. Yes. That, that's awesome. Very proud of them. Yeah, that they love you so much that they would Sacrifice, which is something that's really hard for them. Yes. Yeah. Um, one thing you said in the book is, I know of no post-Mormon who apostatizes flippantly. Mm, they don't. <laughs> I mean, it's a hard decision we make, isn't it? To, it's so hard. To, and, to leave. And active Mormons yeah. cannot see that. They just have very quick dismissals. Yeah. Like with my Christianity Today article, I shared my story. <clears throat> Where is that, by the way? That's in the Today? that's in the October issue in Christianity Today. You can okay. find it online or in good, okay. yeah, the paper, so, or I mean the actual magazine. Um, so I posted a link to that, and I had a family member, not my immediate family. Her response was, you just didn't understand your nature. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh, it's so minimizing. Really? You think I would walk that path where you, I put every relationship on the line. I lost my friends. Yeah. I risked losing family. I lost my whole culture. You think I would do that because I just didn't understand? Or that I did it, yeah. There's no flippant <laughs> exodus from Mormonism. No. Like, it costs so much. Knowing what others are thinking and judging us. And, yes. And, yeah. Which takes a lifetime to unwind from. Tell us about Needlepoint. Does that ring a bell? Oh, Your mom, yeah. mom tells you this. Yes. And, and was this on the trip, too, to, to Lake Powell? No, no. This, this was recently. Time. This was just last Christmas. Okay. I can read it if you want me to. Okay. Do you remember it? I remember I mean, the story, but sure. you can read it. Well, you wrote, I'm flashing back, your mom says this, I'm flashing back to a needlepoint you made when you were eight years old that mm -hmm. said, I will follow Heavenly Father's plan for me. Mm -hmm. Can make me cry. Mm. As you've lived your life over the years, and I see where it's taken you, and the opportunities you've been given to influence others with His love, I see that you've been in the center of His plan all along. That was sweet, wasn't it? It was stunning. Can you talk about... Do uh, mm -hmm. you want to talk about her for a second? Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I had just got... I just received the book offer from Harvest House Publishers. And my daughter comes home from school one day. She was in seventh grade. Oh, about a month after I received the offer. Uh, not even that. The same week I received the offer. And she said, Mom, there's a Utah family that moved in down the street. And I was like, a Utah family? I gotta go meet these people. We've never had neighbors from Utah ever. And so I went down there, uh, drove down there, and I saw a woman walking across the street from that house. And I, I pulled my truck over and I was like, are you the Utah family? And she said, yes. And I said, come here. And it was really like sisterhood at first sight. Yeah. Like Tiffany and I just connected. And so, um, I had her over for lunch. Uh, we had their family over for dinner that week. And then the next week she came over for lunch or the 
No, I had her for lunch first and then the family for dinner. All that to say, I was just thinking, like we discovered right when I introduced myself. I said, can you come over for lunch? She said, sure. And I said, okay, so are you a Mormon or not? Because I need to know if I should serve tea or not. Because <laughs> we're in the South. We serve tea. She's like, I'm a Mormon. I said, okay, got that covered. So I just thought this could be like a sister who I just get to love on and wonderful. I'm excited to have a Mormon neighbor because yeah. I don't get to be with them. So all that to say, um, Tiffany and I sat there and within five minutes she said, what's your story? Were you a Mormon? And I said I was. And so for a Mormon to be that honest and open within five months of meeting is very unusual. Yeah. And she said, tell me your story. And so I started sharing my story and I got to the point where I'd met Gary and he confronted me with those questions. How do you know the church is true? And it began my faith crisis. Um, she said, I cannot believe you're my neighbor. And she just talked about how a year ago she'd started reading the essays that the brethren of the Mormon church, the gospel had, essays, the yeah. gospel doctrine essays. And she was in a complete free fall and just struggling so much with the character of Joseph Smith. And so she was in the thick of her wrestle and I got and to just you journey. <laughs> it was in, it was crazy. It wasn't a God thing, was it? <laughs> oh my gosh. God dropped her down. And then the wild thing is they weren't planning on moving back to Utah and they've moved back to Utah. And so it's like for that season of me writing my story, I got to walk with Tiffany and just point her to the biblical Jesus. Uh -huh. And it's been That's sweet. an incredible journey. I'm good for her. Mm -hmm. One thing that you've mentioned is that you... Um, uh, talk to LDS missionaries and you recommend those of us that do talk to missionaries that we have them bear their testimony and share yes. their testimony with us mm -hmm. and then we in turn share our testimony but you have a conclusion with that do you I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but do you remember what you kind of concluded? What do you concluded? mean a conclusion? Well, just that there must be a better way oh, to know truth. Yeah, that's... well, the testimony for a Mormon is everything. It is so. It's everything. And it's a burning in the bosom, of, as yeah. you mentioned. And it's real. Based on feelings. Yes. Yeah. And the burning in the bosom is real. And so I just, that's my first lead foot forward with a Mormon. Will you share your testimony with me? Like, I genuinely want to know them. And I want to hear, how have you encountered your God? And then I get to share with them my testimony and how I've encountered the biblical God. And when we get to that point where we both believe with all our hearts what we believe is true, then I just offer, there, there's got to be another plumb line for knowing what's true. Because That's we good. both have testimonies that we believe are true. And who am I to say yours is wrong and who are you to say mine is wrong? Yeah. And so what else can we look to to lead us into truth? Well, we're going to wrap up with your testimony, if you would, just uh, how you feel about Jesus now and, and what he... What oh, he Jesus is my everything. He's my beloved. I think that's the most, that's the word I use for Jesus. Like there is such an intimate... Um, intimate encounter with him. All day, every day. And he never leaves us, even when oh. we sin. <laughs> never. Or make mistakes. Yes. Because we are sinful. Yeah. Yep. Well, Lisa, you're wonderful. Thank you. I, I, you know, I'm just thrilled that your parents and your family is as close as they are. Yes. And supportive mm -hmm. and loving and patient. And maybe we'll all come to, to uh, understanding eventually. So... Thank yeah. you so much Thank for sharing. Thank you for having me. It was great say to hi be to with Dennis you. when I you will. see him. And, and we'll see you next time on the Ex Mormon Files.